All right, so I think I can start, right? Okay, so welcome everyone to the TMD part of this uh, school. Uh, let me thank the organizers for the opportunity uh, to uh, say something, I hope say something useful about the topic to you all. Um, teaching is something which is very close to my heart, so I'm very glad to have this opportunity to transfer the knowledge I have, and I'm sure that many of you will have the opportunity to do good things in this field. Uh, this is actually the way we keep science moving forward by transferring the knowledge. So, but first of all, let me, I know that there are more theorists than experimentalists, but so uh, who are the theorists here? Raise your hands, please. Okay, and the other ones are the experimentalists, right? Hands up, please. Okay, okay, I understood you were less, but okay, so how many? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, good, good. What? They, yeah, exactly. They, <laughs> one, one more experimentalist joined. <laughs> That's also a possibility, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so, and who has working knowledge on the topic? So who is more or less familiar to some extent with uh, transverse momentum physics or also GPD physics? Okay. Okay, good, good, very good. Okay, so this set of lectures is not meant to tell you everything about TMD physics, of course, also because I don't know everything about TMD physics, but it's supposed to give you the tools uh, to be able to navigate the literature and uh, to navigate, maybe do some, uh, provide some new contributions to the research uh, and the open problems in the field. So, um, for this reason in the slides, you will find several links to resources in the literature papers, lecture notes, or these kind of things. So I, I, want to, I want you to actually be able to access the PDF files and go to the resources and, and study by yourself, read by yourself. And of course, I'm here the whole week, so you can ask me questions during the lectures, before the lectures, after, whenever you want, not when I'm sleeping, <laughs> okay? So sleeping is something which is very dear to me in this week. <laughs> so, uh, okay, you will have plenty of time during the day. All right. Okay, so let's get started with a brief introduction. Um, we, know, we know that we have a theory to describe the strong interaction, okay? So we know that this theory works very well, and we describe it in terms of quarks and gluons, the elementary degrees of freedom. So the, the, the bottom line is we can, do, we can do many interesting things, but can we understand the properties of hadrons in terms of quarks and gluons? So can we understand the mass, the spin, the size of hadrons in terms of the elementary degrees of freedom of the theory. So by the way, spin, we, we talked about spin several times in these days, and spin is one of the smoking guns for the need of having three-dimensional pictures of your hadrons. So for the need to abandon the collinear, the collinear interpretation of a hard scattering reaction. Uh, can we understand the formation of hadrons, so the hadronization mechanism, can we understand confinement in terms of quarks and gluons alone. Um, can we understand the structure of hadrons in terms of quarks and gluons, starting from the QCD Lagrangian? Well, I mean, the answer is yes, but not with perturbation theory. So what do I mean? Uh, in general, I mean, in field theory, you can compute any kind of observ observable as an expansion in powers of the coupling constant, right? Um, so, that's fine, you can do it for cross-sections, you can do it for whatever you want, more or less. But you have to keep into account that if you calculate, if you want to calculate properties of your hadrons, which are at the scale of the hadron mass, more or less, things go wrong, they go badly wrong. And why is that? Because the coupling constant of the theory actually grows when the energy decreases. Right? So if you do a calculation at high energies, then the, perturbation, the perturbative series converges, more or less, okay? And so you can get a finite answers for what you want to calculate. So this is the regime of perturbative QCD. But if you want to get information about the properties of hadrons at low energy, then these expansions break down, okay? So you cannot get finite answers for your, for your calculations. So you need to abandon at some point perturbation theory and you need alternative techniques. So, as you already know, it is possible to um, uh, get information about the parton distribution functions, for example, uh, 
from the experimental data. We discussed it several times, right? So this is what phenomenologists do. They combine models, approximations, or uh, um, assumptions for the PDFs. They combine it with perturbation theory, and they get information from the experimental data. But there are also other approaches. You can work with an effective, uh, effective theories of QCD, approximations of QCD models, or you can calculate uh, hadronic properties on the lattice. That's another approximation. You can also define objects which are not exactly the PDFs, but are quasi distributions, quasi PDFs or pseudo PDFs and get them uh, from uh, uh, using uh, lattice QCD techniques. So there is a whole world of uh, technologies. That have, yes, a whole set of technologies that you can use to get information about hadron structure. What I do is the phenomenology. So I combine perturbation theory with uh, uh, some assumptions about the hadron structure and the hadronization mechanism, and I try to get information from the experimental data. Okay, so when we talk about hadron physics, uh, there are two make, um, uh, macro areas to investigate. Hadron structures, namely the way uh, quarks and gluons are distributed uh, inside of hadrons, the way the properties of hadron are shaped from quarks and gluons, and hadron formation or hadronization, namely the way a, st a struck quark um, combines, interacts with itself and the vacuum in order to create colorless hadrons. Okay, so these are two sides of the same mechanism or the confinement mechanism. And it's kind of interesting, but also very difficult to understand how by studying hadron structure and hadronization, we can get information on confinement. This is something that we read or hear about several times in, in the literature or in talks. But one of the open questions in research is, can we actually really link PDFs and fragmentation functions to confinement properties? We don't know, okay? There are ideas, but not specific answers, I would say. Okay, so regarding hadron structure, this is a slide that I took from the first reference I give you, which is this nice uh, introductory, introductory paper uh, by Marcus Deal on TMDs and GPDs. That tells you, it's supposed to give you a hint of how many distributions, how many objects we can define in order to get information on hadron structure. So you start from the very, uh, uh, to the most general one, the parton correlation function, and by projecting or integrating out specific variables, you can go down to the Wigner distributions, the generalized parton distributions, the transverse momentum dependent distribution, and the PDFs. Okay. So these relations are, they also, you have to take them uh, uh, with some uh, caveats, but I, I really suggest you to read this paper because it's, it's very nice to, as an introduction. Okay, so let's focus a little bit on uh, TMDs and, and GPDs. If you start from the Wigner distributions, uh, here you have, a, a, say you can describe the hadron in terms of quarks, and these quarks, um, they have uh, both a collinear momentum fraction, which is indicated here by X times P, where P is the momentum of the, of the proton or the hadron, and the transverse momentum KT. But they also have a transverse separation in position space, ZP. Okay, so if you start integrating out these variables, you get to some projections. For example, if you integrate out uh, the uh, transverse momentum, you go here on the right of the slide, and you're left with objects which are related to generalized parton distributions and quark vectors. So this side of the world would be discussed by uh, uh, Barbara Pasquini, Tina Klechter. We will focus on the left part of the slide, which is uh, the, the uh, uh, basically the, the TMDs and the PDFs. You get the TMDs by removing the dependence on the transverse separation, and the PDFs are the most simple objects you can define in this sector here. So these objects basically depend only on the collinear momentum fraction, not on the transverse momentum of the quark anymore. Okay, what does uh, transverse momentum imaging mean? It means that you can take experimental data, so these are data from the COMPASS collaboration, data for semi-inclusive deep elastic scattering in certain kinematic ranges, uh, and you you want to try to get information on the structure of hadrons uh, somehow. So this question mark is really uh, uh, refers to a set of techniques that uh, one can use in order to extract 
information from the experimental data. It is basically a combination of perturbation theory, minimization techniques, statistical techniques. Um, and here it's an example of, for example, the um, parton distribution function, I believe, for a, for a downward in a proton. You see that the slices represent the dependence on transverse momentum. And this dependence on transverse momentum changes with x also, with the collinear, with the collinear variable. So the imaging, the transverse momentum imaging program really uh, corresponds to taking the experimental data, at least for the phenomenology side, and getting information about the structure of hadrons, the hadrons involved. So as we said, um, since repeating things is useful, when we talk about uh, collinear parton distribution functions, we are only accessing the uh, motion of the quark, which is collinear with respect to the direction of motion of the apparent hadron. Whereas when you turn on the transverse momentum dependence, you access the motion of quarks and gluons in the plane, which is transverse with respect to the direction of motion of the hadron. So it, opening up these degrees of freedom is very nice, but it comes with uh, complications, both from the theory side and the experimental side. And we are gonna, we, I'm gonna try to address these difficulties in, in this type, type of lecture. Okay, so this is an example of what you can do uh, uh, with uh, uh, the phenomenology, with an imaging program. From the experimental data, you get um, extractions of the collinear part and distribution functions. Uh, this is, for example, an extraction by the NNPDF collaboration, where you have a neat flavor separation. So you have PDFs, which are different flavor by flavor and also for the gluon. And in this case, you have uh, the transverse momentum dependence for an up quark in the proton, okay? So this is basically the, uh, uh, the corresponding transverse momentum dependence that you can get for uh, um, um, the, an imaging program applied to semi-inclusive DIS data and radion data. So the striking difference, if you, if you notice, between this uh, plot here and this one, is that for the TMD side, we don't have a flavor separation yet. So the different colors here correspond to different X values. But we don't know yet to, to I mean, we don't, we don't know precisely yet, as precisely as for the collinear case, how uh, down quarks move in transit momentum space with respect to up quarks or other quarks. So we don't have a clean flavor separation in the TMD case yet. But this is something we are working on. And it's something pretty important. Also, it has a lot of implication on the high energy physics side, not only for hadron structure. Okay, so talking about hadronization instead, um, you have you can define several objects to uh, study the hadronization mechanism uh, in a similar way to what you can do for the hadron structure uh, case, depending on how inclusive you want to be. Uh, in, uh, in, in your process. So if you detect a single hadron among all the hadrons that you, can, you have here in the final state, uh, you can work with the so-called single hadron fragmentation function. In this case, single hadron collinear fragmentation function because you identify one hadron, one pion out of the 2,000 pions that you have here, and you study only the collinear momentum dependence. You can also have the TMD version of the, of course, the, of the single hadron fragmentation function. So you identify a pion and you study also the transverse momentum dependence with respect to a certain direction that you can specify. But you can be also more exclusive. And instead of studying one hadron, you study two hadrons. So you define dihedron fragmentation functions. These objects are more exotic, but they can be useful for very specific cases. For example, the phenomenology of the transversity distribution function. Uh, if you want to be even more uh, inclusive in the sense that you can detect more hadron, you study jet functions. So you, jet functions are um, ways to cluster some of the hadrons that you have in the final state and study the properties of the hadrons in this jet, okay? or study the global properties of the jet. Yes. The fragmentation functions. So the fragmentation functions are uh, objects that allow you to link um, the fragmentation of a, of a quark, for example, the quark which is uh, at, uh, leaving the hard interaction here, to a specific hadron in the final state. So for example, the most simple one tells you in a loose sense 
what's the probability that this work here fragments into a pion in the final state? Okay. Thanks for the question. And uh, you can you you can study this fragmentation function. I mean, with different in different kinematics with different kind of momentum dependence. But you can study also, as I said, objects which are more inclusive. So instead of studying the probability that a quark produces a one hadron, you study the probability that one quark produces two specific hadrons or one jet of hadrons, a collimated spray of hadrons. Okay. But also, if you study a jet, you can also try to understand what are the properties of a specific hadron inside of the jet. So you have a spray of hadrons in a cone and then you select one pion inside of the jet. And you want to do it because that gives you the possibility to study, for example, spin momentum correlations inside of the jet. Okay. So there is a whole zoo of possibilities here. Um, and actually, hadronization is a very, very interesting topic, which, um, in my opinion, is more likely to be connected to confinement than really the, the PDF themselves. But, Okay, I am recorded now and I should not say these things too loud. <laughs> okay. So, um, in a nutshell, when you have a process with a hadron, either in the final state or in the initial state, you need a soft function like a PDF or a fragmentation function in order to describe the process properly. So, in this case, for example, this is a, a simple diagram to describe uh, uh, inclusive DIS. You have a lepton that scatters off a hadron. There is some kind of hard interaction here, and then you detect another lepton in the final state. So um, if you study the cross-section here, so if you take the square of the Feynman diagram, you can, you can rearrange diagrammatically uh, this yellow blob here, so the, pro the transition from the hadron to the quark state into this kind of diagrams here, which are, which are basically the square of the Feynman, or the square version of a Feynman diagram, okay? So, and this hadronic part can be described and defined in field theory as a two-point function, as a correlation function between two quark fields between two hadronic states. The two P states, P represents the, the, the momentum of the hadron. Okay, so it's really a non-local matrix element that encodes all the information about hadron structure. And this is a matrix in Dirac space, okay? It's something that we cannot calculate in perturbation theory, but we know it is a Dirac matrix. Okay, so one way to study and to get information on this object here is to say, okay, it's a Dirac matrix, what can I do? I expand it on the basis of Dirac matrices that I know, and the coefficients of this expansion will be related to uh, my pardon distribution functions. So it's something that you don't know, you don't know how to calculate, but you know it is a Dirac matrix. So why not using the fact that you know how to describe, you know the basis for the space of Dirac matrix. This is, the, this is basically the idea behind this. And then once you, once you describe this object as a Dirac matrix, you can get the coefficients of that expansion on the Dirac matrices as traces, basically. And the PDFs are linked to these traces. But okay, this is just the introduction. We're gonna go to the details later on, don't worry. Okay, at, at this point, I think it's very useful also to focus on the object U that stands between the two quark fields. So U is the so-called gauge link or Wilson line, and it is an object that makes these two-point functions, this correlation function uh, invariant under gauge transformations. It is crucial to have that gauge link there. Without that gauge link, a lot of the effects that we know about TMD physics would not be there. For example, all the TOD functions, the, the TOD uh, correlations in the, uh, in the hadronics, uh, in the hadronic sector, um, like the Sievers effect or the Bormulders effect. So this object here, it's something that um, emerges directly from the factorization theorems. It's not something that you put by hand, okay? It's something that really emerges from the factorization of processes in terms of parton distribution functions or transverse momentum dependent parton distribution function functions. But one way to think about it, which I, which I believe is very useful, is the following. So imagine, so I said this is a two-point correlation function between zero and psi. 
Okay, so what does it mean? It means that you're probing the correlation between um, a, um, a Dirac field at space time point zero and a Dirac field at space time point psi. Okay, so mathematically, to uh, you know, combine those two fields, psi bar and, and, and psi, you need to parallel transport one field into the space of the other. So you need to bring, for example, psi bar into the space where psi, psi lives. How do you do it? You do it with the parallel transport equation, okay? With, with, that's the same, uh, which is the same equation that you use, for example, in general relativity. Um, and that um, tells you that um, the geometric, that, that QCD has a profound geometric interpretation as well. It's a gauge theory, a gauge theories are geometric theories, okay? The connection formally in terms of uh, the geometry, the connection here is the gluon field. And so by, by following this path in space time, okay, you can parallel transport in the Dirac space, this field into the other, into the space of the other. So um, this is something that usually you don't find on textbooks, but I, I believe it's an, uh, a non-trivial way to think about it. And it, in, in my opinion, it gives, uh, it, I mean, it clarifies the role of, of the gauge link in, in these two, uh, two point function. Mm, something very peculiar that happens uh, in QCD and in the definition of transverse momentum dependent PDFs is the following thing. So this path here is not arbitrary. So here I draw a generic line because to make it gauging, because to make this object gauge invariant, you can, follow, you can follow any path. The important thing is that U is there. So what happens in, in QCD is that when you factorize a process in terms of TND PDFs, the path, the blue line, is actually specified by the process, okay? So if you, if you factorize uh, Drellian, so proton-proton collisions into uh, lepton and anti-lepton, this path here has a very specific shape in space-time. It's a staple that goes to minus infinity in the infinite minus direction, then it goes in the transverse direction, and then it goes back along the minus direction. We will, we will see it later. If you, if you do the same thing in semi-inclusive DIS, you find another uh, path. So there are relations between these gauge links with different paths, and that, that's what generates uh, the sign change relations in the t odd functions, in, in, the, in the time reversal odd set. But again, we, we are just, this is just an introduction. We are gonna see that later in detail. Actually, one of the things I want to show you, maybe also the blackboard, is how uh, the sign change relation for the Sievers function emerges. So we, we, I think one of the goals of this lecture is to rec, uh, really prove from the theory point of view that the Sievers function changes sign uh, from Drellian to CD, so under time reversal process, time reversal transformation. And then we leave it to our experimental colleagues to. <laughs> Uh, to complete the job and, and try to falsify or confirm this uh, striking prediction of QCD. Okay, so let me, let me give you a selection of useful references at this point, um, because if you wanna, I mean, go deeper, uh, you just, I mean, you can talk to me, but I gonna, I'm, I'm giving you like my limited perspective on the field. So there are many people who wrote many interesting things and I, uh, I, this is my suggestion uh, for you. So these are lecture notes from graduate schools like this one um, that you can have a look at. Uh, so there are the lecture notes by uh, Vincenzo Barone, Alessandro Bacchetta, Bob Jeffy, and Pete Mulders. So these were four different uh, graduate schools. So you're gonna, I think you're gonna find the slides online and you can click on these links. Uh, books, very interesting ones in my, in my opinion are the book on transverse spin physics by uh, Baron and Radcliffe. So this is really focused on the physics of transverse spin. Then the red book. Uh, the red book is kind of the Bible for this, thing, for, for, for this field, and it's the book by John Collins, Foundations of Perturbative QCD. Here you can find all the details about the factorization theorems. It's a very formal but very deep book. So a more introductory book, I believe, is the book by uh, Devonish and Cooper Sarkar on deep inelastic scattering. You find a lot of details also on the experimental side about the, uh, for the process of DIS and also related processes. It talks about CDs and Relian as well. And then the book by uh, Muta, 
again, foundations of QCD. It's something that I used when I uh, studied QCD from, uh, from Marco Radici. And it goes very deep on the, um, uh, on the operator product expansion side. So I, I believe it's a very useful reference to learn about the OP. Okay, then papers and reviews. I don't wanna go through all of them, uh, but I take your time, uh, spend, spend some hours reading these uh, um, papers and reviews because I believe they're very interesting. I already pointed you to this introduction by Mark for here. And then, okay, something which can be useful is the um, uh, web page, the HUGS pedagogical web page. It's a, it's a collection of references which was put together by the organizers of the HUG school, which, uh, which is a graduate school which is run in Jefferson Lab. Okay, and this section here in particular has introductory topics on in Hadron physics. Okay, experimental overviews. Um, something that I found uh, pretty useful is to look at what the next experiments are gonna, are gonna try to find. So for example, Abe's talk was, was very nice today. Uh, and I suggest you to read also about the JLab 12 physics program and of course the, uh, uh, the, next, uh, uh, the next frontier in QCD, which is the electron ion collider. The last one is the most recent one. And it contains also a lot of phenomenology and impact studies uh, that we worked out in the TMD field, trying to understand how the EAC is gonna bring um, um, how the, the AC is gonna improve our knowledge for hadron structure and hadronization. Okay, the plan of these lectures. Today there was a little bit of introduction and then we are gonna see what happens um, when we try to break hadrons. I believe that most of the things I will say next uh, have been covered in the previous lectures, but in the spirit of repeating things, since this is a school, uh, I think it's useful. Then tomorrow we are gonna discuss about um, partons in general, and how to introduce collinear and TMD parton distribution functions. And then we are gonna focus on the symmetry properties of these objects. Uh, so this is where I would like to, I mean, also derive the sign change for the Sievers function, which comes from the symmetries of the theory. And we're gonna talk about spin, spin asymmetries. Then on Thursday, we're gonna have a look at factorization, evolution, and the matching of the TMDs, and finally some phenomenology. Okay, so again, if you have questions, you can also interrupt me now, uh, or we can discuss later. Okay, so, okay, well, we don't have too much time, but I think it's gonna be enough. So I, I, can, I can go pretty quick on this part because I mean, we already, we already discussed uh, about DIS, but in a sense, you can think about DIS as the same experiment that was performed in around 1910 to understand uh, what was inside nuclei, for example, the Geiger uh, Rutherford experiment, where they were shooting alpha particles on gold foils, and they, they found the evidence for atomic nuclei. So the DIS experiments were more or less the same thing, but, but on a much smaller, much smaller scale. Okay, here, um, scientists understood that the, the hadrons are not point-like, okay? They, they, have, they, are, they have constituents. And with DIS experiments, there was the first experimental evidence of three point-like spin one half constituents inside of the proton, the so-called parton. Okay, so DIS is a process where you scatter a lepton of a target, okay? And you just detect the lepton in the final state. You don't detect anything else. To describe, mathematically to describe the cross-section uh, for DIS, uh, it's good to go to choose a light cone basis, so a set of two vectors, okay, that have these properties, they have a zero norm, and the scalar product is equal to one. Okay, so these are two vectors that stay on the light cone, light-like. Then you can parameterize a generic vector, either in Cartesian coordinate or in light cone coordinates, okay? And um, say you can work either with the, 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 the time like and the spatial component or the plus, minus, and the, the transverse component. So I'm saying this because we're going to speak a lot about transverse momentum, uh, light cone plus, light cone minus. This is the definition. This is what is applied, uh, I mean, uh, to vectors in, 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 in all the cases. 
when you when you hear about transverse momentum it means that you're considering the one two so the x y components of a specific uh, momentum okay and then when we say when we talk about transverse space or transverse transverse plane we mean really the place the sorry the uh, the space the plane which is orthogonal to uh, um, uh, it's orthogonal to z and uh, it's actually you can project vectors to that transverse space using uh, the transverse matrix okay gt which is defined here and gt and epsilon t which is the contraction of the levi civita tensor with the two light cone basis vectors are the two objects that you use to calculate scalar products and vector products uh, with the two-dimensional transverse vectors okay so dis which what's the kinematics that we can use so we have we can build the following invariants s w square and q square using these momenta uh, the momentum of the target the spin of the target if the target has a spin and l and l prime which are the momenta of the scattering and the scattered electrons or leptons in general okay so we, we, we already know by now that the deep, deep inelastic regime is, is the regime where Q square and P dot Q um, go to infinity. In practice, you, you, you do it by uh, selecting an energy Q square, which is much larger than the invariant mass, invariant mass of the target. And you keep this x Birkin variable fixed. Okay, so we, we mentioned spin. So spin is described with density operators or matrices in, as, we, as you do in quantum mechanics. So if you describe a spin one alpha object like a proton or a neutron, um, in order to construct a density operator, you need um, the Pauli matrices basically. Okay, you need the identity matrix here and then these SI quantities, which are just numbers, multiplying the Pauli matrices. So it's basically the scalar product between a three-dimensional spin vector and a vector made out of, made out of the uh, Pauli matrices. Then you can build out, you can build a covariant spin vector just adding a zero, a time-like component uh, for the spin. Okay, so when you, when you, when in the literature or in these lectures you, you find a covariant spin vector, it's basically this. So it's the spin vectors plus the zero component equal to zero. Um, of course, I mean, you don't do DIS only on, on, on the proton, but you can also do DIS or other experiments using spin one targets like the deuteron. Okay, in this case, you need a more complicated object to describe the spin. You need, again, a spin vector here, but you also need a matrix or a tensor of rank two, okay, to parameterize all the possible polarization of the target. So in principle, you have all the degrees of freedom of the spin one half case, and then you have a spin matrix or the so-called tensor polarization for the IS, for, for the deuteron. Okay, so I'm saying this because in the lectures we will find it, uh, I, will, I will tell you that some things have been calculated for spin one half, but not completely for spin one, and that's, those are potential research directions, but I want, you to, I want you to know what's the difference between working with a spin one half and a spin one. Okay, so the take home message, spin one, spin one out is easy. You just need a spin vector. For spin one, you need a spin vector and a spin matrix. Yes. Uh, spin one. So in this uh, matrix structure, uh, these three columns represent the different polarization states. Which one? I mean, first column, second column, third column. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, okay, so the I'm, I did not explain the notation because it's pretty lengthy to explain, but basically they correspond to um, different ways that you can combine longitudinal and transverse polarization. Um, actually, this reference is quite detailed. Uh, and I recommend you to, to read it. Okay. It's also kind of difficult to picture how to work. So orienting a vector is easy. Orienting the components of a matrices is, I mean, it's not difficult, but you have to understand how, how, how to do it. 
Okay, so you basically have a richer spin structure. You can study orbital, moment, orbital angular momentum effects in the target, which are not present in the spin one half case. Oh, okay, yes. So we said that for DIS, but for other processes as well, you can describe the cross section as a contraction of two tensors. A contraction of a leptonic tensor, L mu nu, which describes basically the incoming and the outgoing electron, okay? And a tensor, W, W mu nu, which is the, um, contains all the hadronic part, okay? Whatever happens when the lepton scatters a photon on the target. So this diagram here is the, one of the so-called cut diagrams, okay? And the, it represents the product of two Feynman amplitudes which do not need to be the same. They can also, you can also have uh, the interference between one Feynman diagram and another Feynman diagram, not, not the specular case. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is that this dashed line, so the cut represents on shell states. So whatever crosses the cut is a real thing. It's not a virtual particle. So this photon is virtual, okay? Because it stays between, uh, since the question came up this morning, so this photon is virtual because it's exchanged and everything is exchanged between the lepton and the target and everything works as if these two external particles, the target and the lepton, scatter the photon, okay? But you don't see that, you, don't, you, you cannot measure that virtual particle. But if something crosses the cut, it means that it's entering the detector. So it's a particle for which P squared has to be equal to the mass squared. So it's a, it's a real thing. So it has to be, it has to obey the on-shell relation for the momentum. That's why it's called on-shell particle. Okay, so um, again, okay, I already said this. This is the leptonic tensor. It's QED. It's completely calculable, okay? Uh, this is the one photon exchange approximation, but you can have more complicated diagrams. So L mu nu here is general, and here I'm using the uh, expression for the sequence photon exchange, but you can have more complicated diagrams. And then you have the hadronic tensor, which is not calculable in QCD. Actually, not completely, as Ravindran mentioned previously. You can do all the renormalization of these objects, but you cannot calculate the intrinsic properties in perturbation theory. You can calculate it in, in other ways with Hamiltonian approaches, approximation, and so on and so forth, or you do phenomenology. Okay. So in this case, uh, when the single photon exchange approximation, uh, you have the photon that feeds the uh, electromagnetic current in the target. And, okay, in the case of the weak interaction, the current would be different, but now we are working in the single photon, in the, in the single, single photon exchange approximation. Um, since we cannot calculate it completely, we use the same strategy that we used, that I mentioned for the correlation function uh, 15 minutes ago. We know it's a matrix. It's a Lorentz matrix because it has two open indexes, mu, mu, nu. We know how to, I mean, uh, parameterize this kind of structures. We use Lorentz structures, okay? And we stick coefficients to the basis, the matrix uh, that form the basis. So this, these are not, this is not the, the most general like, expansion on, on, on Lorentz tensors that you can write out for the hadronic tensor. But it's constrained, the number of structures here is constra constrained by the proper symmetries of the theory. Parity invariance, time reversal invariance, gauge invariance, and also the hermeticity. So by, by putting all these conditions together, you boil down the, uh, the whole expansion to four terms. Okay. Um, so this is very important. We already discussed it in, pre in the previous lectures, but it's a very generic strategy uh, um, that, I mean, applies to all processes. At lunchtime, we discussed about parity invariance with, with some of you. Uh, someone, wanna, someone was asking, okay, what, what happens if I remove the constraint of parity? What, what do you think happens? If I remove one of the symmetries here, for example, parity. Twice? Yeah, you would have more terms in the expansion because the more constraints you put, the less structures you will have. Okay, so of course, we, we know that QCD should be parity invariant, but nothing prevents you from removing this constraint and see what happens. You define another structure, 
And then you try to see comparing with experimental data, for example, if this term is zero or not. You have to understand if it's zero uh, or not within errors. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a difficult game to play. Okay, so as I mentioned, for example, if you also if you work with the weak interaction, you would have you know parity, but this is a different story. And if you include spin, you have different terms. Okay, this is the uh, Adronic tensor for the unpolarized case. So um, you can reorganize the information on the previous slides uh, by rearranging the Lorentz structures in terms of different coefficients that we call structure functions in this case. So you see that. Um, we have two structure functions, F1 and F2, and the Lorentz structures are the following, but you can rearrange also the definition of the Lorentz structures and redefine these structure functions in, in another way. But I mean, this is just a way to rearrange the, uh, it's just a game of rearranging the Lorentz structures in, in a way that is more useful or not. Um, so these structure functions here, do they tell you something about the structure of hadrons or not? What do you think? Yes, someone said yes. Yes, someone, does someone say no? Okay. Well, I mean, they tell you how the target, the hadron, responds to an external excitation like a photon. When you try to break the hadron, what happens? But they don't tell you yet information about the uh, really the partonic structure. You don't see, you, there are no partons in this, in this formula, right? It's just the decomposition of the Adronic tensor in terms, in terms of functions multiplying Lorentz structures. These functions here, they tell you how the hadron responds to an external uh, excitation, but you don't see quartz or gluons yet. So that's what we're gonna see tomorrow. So the F, as I said, F1, F2 are the standard unpolarized the area structure functions. Then you can rewrite them in terms of Ft and Fl uh, using a different basis for, for your tensor. Um, if you add the spin, you get two other structure functions, okay? Uh, for, the for the case when the target is longitudinally polarized, so if you have a longitudinal spin, Sl, you have the FLL structure function, and here, you have the structure function FLT, which is related to the transverse polarization. So what do LL and LT mean? So these are mm, subscripts that refer to the polarization of the incoming beam and the polarization of the target. So this structure function here requires um, a longitudinally polarized beam and a longitudinally polarized target. And similarly for the other one, you need a longitudinally polarized beam and a, longitudinally, and a transversely polarized target. Okay, there are also uh, contributions related to um, the transverse polarization of the beam. So polar, um, contributions which are uh, um, related to uh, electrons being polarized in a transverse way with respect to the direction of motion, but those are um, I mean, not proportional to the value of the uh, electron mass. So they are very, very tiny and they can be suppressed in general. If you work with muons instead, they would be much, much larger. So you might wanna take them into account. But if you do DIS with an electron beam, you can neglect them, okay? Again, so if you do DIS on a tensor polarized target, so if you have the deuteron, you have four additional structure functions here. So you see that um, by increasing the spin of the target, you get more and more structure functions. So you get more ways in which your target responds to uh, the photon which is shot by the electron. Okay, so this is the cross-section for the unpolarized nucleon. As we said, as for the adronic tensor in the uh, spin one half case, we have four structure functions, FT, FL, the double L, and the LT. But as I said, there are no quarks and gluons in this description yet. Um, there are no partons, but don't worry, we're gonna see them tomorrow. Um, at this point, before closing the lecture, I just wanted to tell you that I was planning actually to have some exercises, uh, both analytically at the blackboard and also numerically. Since, I mean, in our field, it's very important also to, uh, I mean, be able to, to deal with the, with the computer, with software, 
Uh, it's not all about numerics, of course, but when you compare your theory with experimental data, you have to get your, get your hands dirty uh, with a computer. So something I want to tell you is about, um, something I wanted to show you is how to do exercises with two software. One which is Python based, which is Google Colab, and the other one is Mathematica. Okay. The advantage of Mathematica is that it's a higher level um, say, um, programming language. You have many functions which are already coded, okay, and you can use it, but you have to pay for it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay, There's, <laughs> there is no free lunch, as they say. Um, but so also, Python has many tools to do symbolic calculations. In particular, this uh, SymPy uh, uh, library is pretty useful. You can do, for example, um, um, calculations of uh, Dirac structures, contractions of Dirac structures, as the fine calc package in Mathematica does. So at this point, I wanted to tell you, so since we are gonna see exercises with these two programming languages, just try to, um, install them on your computer. The first one is very easy because if you have a Google account, you can access Google Colab for free. Maybe you have to install some plugin in the web browser, but Google Colab is basically um, uh, um, an initialization of Jupyter, a Jupyter notebook, okay? And you, it creates a virtual machine in your browser with a Python, uh, with a Python, uh, um, with, with Python, and you can run notebooks there, okay, without doing anything. For Mathematica instead, you, if you don't have it, you can download the trial version, which you can use for 15 days, I believe, okay. Um, but so I was trying to play with uh, the Mathematica installation after lunch, and I saw that you can get a license from this internet connection, uh, but so there is a, if you, if you connect to the Mathematica server, it says that the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research provides uh, a license, but I think it only works within, within these walls. Okay, so it's not something uh, that you can take outside. Um, okay, good. So do you have questions at this point? Not yet. Say it again. Yes. Yes. So, okay, if you introduce spin, you get an anti-symmetric part in the hadronic tensor. Yes, yes. For example, you have, uh, you see if you have the epsilon uh, mu nu tensor here. But uh, uh, this I understand, what was the question? Yeah. 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 You. Yeah. You have to get. Um, yeah. Okay. So you need an antisymmetric part in the leptonic tensor too, which comes in with the lepton polariz polarization. Yes. So you see that you see that this structure function here has two L indices. It means that both the beam and the target need to be polarized. Yeah. Thanks. That's a good point. Yeah, so if you remove parity in the hadronic part, yeah, exactly, that's okay. That's, that's, uh, that's precisely the fact that you get an anti-symmetric part from the hadronic, in the hadronic side, removing parity violation tells you that you need the polarization in the beam, yes. Any other question? Okay, well, I'm gonna be around. Thank you.